going to go ahead and start on chapter two, which is the chemical basis of life. And so for this chapter, we're going to go over some basic chemistry. Don't get scared, it's very simple. We'll do a few basic calculations, nothing hard, just addition, subtraction, and go over some basic rules for chemistry and how to determine whether something has a bunch of protons or neutrons or electrons. All right, let's get started. All right, so introduction, how might a chemical compound in the air harm coral reefs? The answer is chemistry. So when carbon dioxide is dissolved into water, it reacts with that water to actually form an acid, which then makes the water more acidic. And all of life's chemistry is tied to water. So life first evolved in water. All living organisms require water and all of our cells consist of at least 70% water. So here are our big ideas for chapter two. We're going to go over atoms and the different things that are contained within atoms. We'll go over elements and compounds as well. We're going to go over the different types of chemical bonds. the different types of chemical bonds, and then water's life supporting property. So what is so special about water that helps to support life here on Earth? All right, so let's talk about elements, atoms, and compounds. So organisms are composed of elements, usually combined into something called compounds. So living organisms are all composed of something called matter, and matter is composed of chemical elements. So there are about 25 elements that we have here that are essential for life. One second, a little pin out. Okay. There are about 25 elements that are essential for human life. Sorry, trying to draw some stuff on here. Here we go. Put a big circle around 25, okay? But there are only four elements that make up about 96% of the weight of most living organisms. So a compound is a substance consisting of two or more different elements. All right, so let's look at those elements that are most common for the human body. So we are carbon-based life forms, but most of our body is actually composed of oxygen. If you see right here, we have 65% oxygen, 18.5% carbon, about 9.5% hydrogen, 3.3% nitrogen, we have some calcium and some phosphorus. So these are the top one, two, three, four, five, and six elements that make up the human body with oxygen, carbon and hydrogen being the most abundant elements that we have in our bodies. So trace elements are common additives to our food and water. So some are required to prevent disease. So for example, um, most water supply here in the US, we have fluoride added to it, and that helps to prevent tooth decay. So, and also a lot of our salt contains trace elements to make sure that we can maintain a healthy thyroid. In other places, they don't add something called iodine to our salt. You might have seen it, those big giant kind of tubs of salt, and it might say iodized or iodinized salt. And that just makes sure that we can maintain that healthy thyroid. In other, some other countries, third world countries, they don't add iodine to their salt. And you'll see a high percentage of the population with something called a goiter, which is kind of that swollen thyroid tissue, kind of like a little tire or a little inner tube sitting around the throat. So these help to preserve the food sometimes. Sometimes these chemicals can make it more nutritious or make it look better. So we do have some foods that have preservatives and that helps to preserve the shelf life of something. But there are a lot of foods nowadays they don't have any preservatives and they are marketed that way. So of course they are healthier for you, but they don't last as long on the shelf. All right, next up, let's talk about atoms. They are so exciting. So atoms consist of protons, neutrons, and also electrons. So each element consists of one kind of atom. So an atom, so don't get this definition confused with a cell because that is something that confuses people sometimes on these tests. An atom is defined as the smallest unit of matter that still retains the properties of an element. 
So there are three subatomic particles found in every atom. First off, we have neutrons. And just like it sounds, neutrons have a neutral charge. And neutral meaning that it has just a zero charge, so not positive, not negative, it's just neutral. And neutrons, just like they sound, neutrons are found inside of the nucleus. So I think the neutrons are the easiest one to memorize. So neutrons are neutral and they're found in the nucleus. All right, next up we have protons. Protons are positive. So just like saying you're pro something, which means you support something, protons are positive for something. So I think that name goes together well, just like that as well. Uh, protons are also found within the nucleus. Next up, the last subatomic particle we have is something called an element. Um, electron, sorry. These have a negative charge, all right? These are not found within the nucleus. Rather, they kind of circulate in kind of a little cloud surrounding the nucleus, all right? So the number of protons is an element's atomic number. All right, next up. Um, an atom's mass number, on the other hand, is the number of protons plus the number of neutrons that are found in the nucleus. The atomic mass is approximately equal to its mass number. There is something that varies a little bit between atoms. We have something called isotopes. And for these, an element will have the same number of protons, but the number of neutrons will vary. So for example, a nitrogen atom has seven protons and its most common isotope has seven neutrons, okay? but a radioactive isotope of nitrogen has nine neutrons. What is the atomic number and mass number? So of course, before this, the mass number would be, if we were just looking at the most common isotope, we would do the seven protons plus the seven neutrons, which would give us a mass number of 14. But for this radioactive isotope, we would add those seven protons plus the nine neutrons, okay? And so that would give us a slightly different number. So all the elements you see on the periodic table, it's kind of putting together all of the different types of acid, um, isotopes and coming up with an average number. And that is the number of neutrons that you'll see on the periodic table. All right, so for example, let's look here. So this might be a little bit easier to understand when you see this picture. So this is an atom, this whole thing right here, this circle. And then we have a nucleus, which is the middle part. So if you are familiar with how cells look, a nucleus is typically the center part, usually the larger part of a cell. Okay, so nucleus right here in the middle. We have our positive charges right here, our protons. We have our neutral charges right here, which are our neutrons. And look, then surrounding the nucleus right here, we have the electrons in something called an electron cloud. Okay, so remember, remember right here in the nucleus, we're going to have neutrons and protons, the positive and neutral charges. And on the outside, we're going to have the electrons, which are those negative charges. So for example, looking at isotopes of carbon, we have carbon 12, which was the most common carbon we find. We have carbon 13 and carbon 14. Just looking at this again, for example, for carbon 12, we have six protons, six neutrons. Something else to note is that protons are always equal to the number of electrons and electrons are always equal to the number of protons. Okay, so that doesn't really change. The only thing that's going to change is the amount of neutrons. So looking here at carbon 13, now we have seven neutrons. And looking at carbon 14, now we have 18. So that does vary that mass number. And remember, isotopes just vary in the number of neutrons while those protons are going to stay the same. All right, so don't get confused on that as well in the test. All right, so we also have something called radioactive isotopes, and you can kind of tell in the name that it radioactive is going to be harmful for the human body. They are useful though as tracers for monitoring different atoms and living organisms. So we have things like MRI machines that can actually you swallow something, usually a, um, a liquid dye with tracers in it, then you get an imaging done and it sees whether these different tracers attach to something that could be harmful to the human body, okay? You just don't wanna to have too much of it. 
All right, next up, let's talk about chemical bonds. So the distribution of an electrons um, determines an atom's chemical properties. So electrons are located in something called electron shells that surround the nucleus. So depending on how many electrons are present, that determines how many shells that element actually has. So the outermost shell is something called a valent shell, or we can just call it the outermost shell. And those shells like to be full of electrons. So if you only have one shell available, that first shell only has two electrons to make it full, make it stable. But every other shell after that, depending on how many electrons there are, there need to be eight whole electrons available to make those, um, make those shells stable. So with an atom whose outer electron shell is not full, it tends to interact more and be more unstable than an electron who has a full outer shell. So these are able to share, they can gain, or they can actually totally lose their electrons. And these result in attractions called chemical bonds, depending on whether they're sharing, gaining, or losing. And let's go over a couple of those different types of bonds. But first, here's a picture. Uh, right here, you see right here in the middle, this gray part will be a nucleus. And this electron, this element has one, two shells. So this first shell is full with just two electrons. This next shell actually needs eight electrons to be extremely stable or totally stable. So because this one only has one, two, three and four electrons, that means it's not very stable and is going to interact freely with other elements that are around it. Okay, so here is a small part of the periodic table. Don't worry, you do not have to memorize this. It's just here to show you the amount of electrons. So this gray portion right here in the middle is the nucleus and you see all these blue circles that surround these different nuclei. They have different numbers, if you see right here, of electrons. If you look on to the first shell, this hydrogen, this actually only accepts one electron. But then looking over here on the right side of the table at helium, neon, argon, these are um, noble gases and they're very stable. You see helium, it only has one layer and it has two electrons. So that means that that, that electron cloud is totally stable, it doesn't have pretty much any interactions, right? Because it's stable, it doesn't need anything. Neon as well, argon as well, okay? So these gases are used a lot in chemistry, physics to actually neutralize things. So let's talk about covalent, jump, uh, covalent bonds. These involve electron sharing. So the key word for covalent bonds is sharing. The only difference that you'll see are whether those electrons are equally shared or whether they are unequally shared. So for example, non-polar covalent bonds, these electrons are shared equally. But with polar covalent bonds, these electrons are shared unequally. So think of a pole, so the North Pole versus the South Pole, so two totally separate distances, if you can see this, right, a top and a bottom, think of a pole so we'll say the top part of the pole is more positive, the bottom part is going to be more negative, and so they're going to attract electrons differently. So if an element has more um, negativity for it, it's going to, if it's more electronegative, it's actually going to attract electrons more positively for some reason, right? So that's where we get the unequal sharing. So for these type of bonds, as the electrons are pulled more toward the more electronegative element, um, it's actually going to get more of a negative charge and as those elements are being pulled away or these electrons being pulled away to the other element, the one on the other side gets a more positive charge because it's kind of losing a little bit of negativity. So you're going to have a slightly positive charge and a slightly negative charge for that polar covalent bond, okay? So remember these key words. Covalent bonds involve electron sharing and you can either have equally shared electrons with non-polar covalent bonds, or you can have unequal sharing with polar covalent bonds that results in a slightly positive and a slightly negative charge, okay? 
So looking at this, we have our neutron right here in the middle, our nucleus right here. We have our protons, of course, in the middle as well. And then our electron cloud is this kind of blue puffy thing around it. So as these two hydrogen ion um, atoms approach, the electron of each atom is also attracted to the proton in the other's nucleus. So right here and right here. The two electrons become shared in something called a covalent bond. Right, So because they are sharing these um, electrons right here as depicted, so now that first shell is fully stable, right? So they're each going to have two electrons in that first shell, so they're very, very stable. Okay, so let's take a look at water. So water has, an, if for example, has polar covalent bonds. So we have H2O, that is the chemical formula of water. We have two hydrogen atoms right here and one oxygen. So because oxygen is more, it's more electronegative, which means it's going to attract these imaginary electrons right here between the different elements, it's going to get a slightly negative charge because the electrons are closer to that oxygen. While the hydrogen ion, so right here and right here, these are going to get a slightly positive charge because those negative charges are kind of being pulled more closely to that more attractive oxygen, okay? All right. So let's talk about ionic bonds. So ionic bonds are attractions between ions of opposite charges. So if you have ever heard the term opposites attract, it is true in chemistry. I don't know about people, but it's true in chemistry. So an ion is an atom or a molecule that has some type of electrical charge, either a positive charge or a negative charge. And that results from gaining or losing electrons. So if a um, element, or a molecule gains um, an electron, that means it becomes negatively charged because electrons have negative charges. But if that atom or molecule actually loses an electron, um, it becomes more positive because some negativity is leaving its environment, right? So now it can be more positive. So two ions with opposite charges attract each other. So, but when that attraction holds those ions together, it's called an ionic bond. So that positive plus that negative come together and kind of attract each other, but they don't share the electrons. It's just those opposite charges attracting each other, all right? So let's think of salt. It is an ionic compound. So it consists of something called sodium and chloride. And I can't really write on here for some reason. Let's see. One second. Let's say we have sodium, it has a positive charge, and we have chlorine, it has a negative charge. So sodium chloride is just your basic table salt. Ah, it went away. So when you see here, I drew that, that positive charge right here, and then that negative charge right here. So those two opposite charges are going to attract each other very strongly. So an ionic bond is stronger than a covalent bond. Okay, so for example, here's our sodium right here in the yellowish color and our chlorine right here in the greenish color. And as you can see, that first layer, it has those two electrons right? This second layer or second level has its eight electrons, but its outermost shell only has one electron. So this sodium is very unstable. It wants to give away this electron so bad so that it can go back down to just two rings and be stable and be happy, right? Chlorine is the first two levels are full, but that last level is missing just a single electron. So it's trying to get an electron so bad so that it can be stable. So what happens is that sodium is going to kind of donate that extra electron over here to the chlorine to its outermost level. So now the sodium, this last level goes away and now it's nicely stable. Okay, the chlorine, it's now gained this additional electron and so now it's nicely stable. 
and those positive and negative charges are going to attract each other. So now that sodium becomes positive and that chlorine becomes negative still, right? So now we have something called sodium chloride and they become ions. See this? You put a charge right here next to sodium and a charge right here next to chlorine just because that sodium gave away its kind of negativity so it got more positive, and the chlorine gained an extra negative charge in the form of, of an, um, that electron, and so now it's kind of more, it's more negative, you know, it's a little bit more sad. All right, so sodium positive, chlorine negative, and those unequal charges are kind of attracting each other. Okay, so this is a molecule of salt, and here's our, sodi our sodium and our chlorine attracted to each other. All right, next, let's go over this other kind of bond. We have something called a hydrogen bond. So this is a weak bond, all right? So the hydrogen items of a water molecule are attached to oxygen by those polar covalent bonds that we talked about. So they are sharing electrons, but not equal, right? So unequal sharing. So because of these polar bonds and kind of the Y kind of V shape of this molecule, the water is a polar molecule. And that just means it's going to have a positive and a negative charge, right? So we're gonna have that slightly negative charge on oxygen and then those slightly positive charges on hydrogen. Okay, so here is a picture. So the way that water molecules bond to each other, we have hydrogen bonds in between these different water molecules, so H2O, and then water, so the O, which is oxygen, and these hydrogen ions, that is what's forming that polar covalent molecule between the actual H2O, and then you have hydrogen bonds between um, the different water molecules. All right, so next, chemical reactions make and break chemical bonds. So water is formed, of course, from hydrogen and oxygen, and that's an example of a chemical reaction. So matter is changed as bonds are kind of broken and reformed, but they do not destroy this matter. They only rearrange it in various ways, okay? So just like matter, um, energy is never created nor destroyed. It's just kind of converted from one form to another. Okay, so for example, we have two hydrogen ions right here, atoms right here, I'll say. Um, one oxygen, or actually two bound right here. So H2O, and here is the resulting product. You're gonna get two water molecules. So these, um, these molecules are not destroyed. They're just converted from one form, kind of like a little barbell right here, right? To that nice V shape that we like to see in water. All right, so let's talk about water's life supporting properties. So hydrogen bonds are what make liquid water cohesive. So cohesion is, de is defined as the tendency of molecules of the same kind to stick together. So thinking of water molecules, that is how they stick to each other, something called cohesion. So think if you are jumping into a pool, you're trying to dive, but you land on your belly and do a big belly flop. The reason why it hurts so much is because of that cohesion between those hydrogen bonds, making it just kind of a, a thick, flat surface to kind of cut through, right? So you have to kind of dive in and cut between the hydrogen bonds to get in there. On the other hand, adhesion is the tendency of those molecules to kind of stick to something else or stick to their container. Okay, so for example, you have, you worked out, you have a bunch of sweat on your face. So how is that water, that sweat actually sticking to your face? So the water droplets are held together by cohesion, but those water droplets sticking to your face are held together by something called adhesion because we are not the same thing as water, right? Okay, good. Here's an example of a buggy using um, that um, cohesion and adhesion. This is actually called um, water surface tension to walk on water. All right, so water's hydrogen bonds are also uh, moderate our temperature. So heat is absorbed when hydrogen ions break and then it's released when these hydrogen bonds form again. So this helps to keep our temperatures pretty much steady. Um, the most energetic water molecules, so the ones that are kind of moving the most, that have the most heat, these are going to evaporate 
And as those molecules evaporate, the surface of that substance cools. So for example, sweating. When we start to sweat when we're hot, we have all this heat being released. So as those water molecules are evaporating off, that heat is released and we're able to cool down because we are sweating. Okay, this is something known as evaporating cooling. So think about this, living in Alabama where it's really hot and humid, explain the popular adage, it's the heat, it's not the heat, it's the humidity. So just thinking about that, because there is so much water in our air down here, it kind of stops that cooling and evaporation process, right? So you just stay hot. Okay, so look at this guy, he's sweaty, he was just playing something. And you can see this heat actually leaving off his face, he's really sweaty, and he's actually cooling down because of all that sweat production. And as that water evaporates, the heat's being released, and he's actually, um, we can actively see his cooling process happening here. All right, so another example of water's properties is that ice floats because it is less dense than liquid water. Water can actually exist as a gas, so steam. It can exist as a liquid, so like a glass of water, or a solid, for example, ice. So ice is less dense because of hydrogen bonding. So when water freezes, each molecule forms something called a crystal lattice. And because as these ice crystals form, the molecules are less densely packed. They kind of, kind of separate away from each other, and so that makes them less dense. All right, so let's get on to how water is the solvent of life. So first off, a solution is a liquid consisting of a mixture or two or more substances. So for a solution, you're going to have a solvent and then a solute. So solvent is the liquid portion and the solute is the solid portion. And the solute is actually um, dissolved into the solvent. So think of when you pour maybe a teaspoonful of salt into a glass of water, stir it up, and that salt actually is dissolved into the water. So that salt would be the solute, and the solvent would be the water that you poured the salt into. So water is kind of like a universal, um, a universal solvent, and that means lots of things are dissolved into it. So you can have polar or charged solutes dissolve when water molecules surround them, and that forms something called an aqueous solution. Okay, so for example, you put that salt in the water, so these, these positive hydrogens are attracted to the negative chloride ion, while the negative oxygen, so those slightly negative oxygens, are attracted to the positive sodium ion. So remember, those opposites attract, and they're going to go ahead and bind to their opposites whenever they're put in solution. All right, so the chemistry of life is also very sensitive to acidic and basic conditions. So if anyone has heard of the pH scale before, or acids and bases, this is what I'm talking about. So in liquid water, a small percentage of water molecules break apart into ions. And when I say ions, I mean, let me get my little pen out again. They break up into something called protons. Here we go, protons or hydrogen ions, the same thing and they are positively charged, okay? Or we can get them to break up into something called a hydroxide ion, and this one is negatively charged, okay? So we use the pH scale to describe how acidic or basic a solution is. A buffer, meanwhile, minimizes changes in the pH. So a, a neutral pH is seven. So if you add a buffer, um, you're trying to get that neutral pH back, um, to make it more acidic, it's anything below seven. To make it more basic, it's going to be any number above seven all the way up to 14. Okay, so looking at our pH scale, you see we have right here in the middle, we have a neutral pH. And that's about a seven, which is pure water, human blood, tears, things like that. Um, that means you have an equal amount of positive ions and an equal amount of negative ions. So anything lower than seven, usually down to zero, that's going to be more acidic, 
okay? Um, higher positive ion concentrations, these are going to make it more acidic. So you see here, for example, we have things like lemon juice, vinegar, tomato juice, battery acid. These are more acidic solutions, and they're going to have a higher number of these positive hydrogen ions present. Can you see that? The neutral solution is going to have an equal amount of hydrogen and hydroxide ions. A more basic solution, anything 7 to 14, the higher this hydroxide or OH negative concentration, and that just means it gets more and more basic. So think of your basic household cleaners, laundry detergent, um, antifreeze. These are all more basic um, compounds, we'll say, or basic solutions. So you see here, there are more negative ions than those positive ions present. Okay, so this is our, this is our um, acidic pH scale and our basic pH scale. All right, so that's it. Let me know if you have any questions and be sure to answer the questions in the little quiz that's going to come after this lecture video so that you can get your full points. All right, thank you. Have a good day.